Hey, it's Talknosis. It's a show about Gnosticism, which might not be a thing. Uh, we've got Dr. M. David Litlaw here, who will talk about some of the definitions of that term. I'm sure we will get to that. Uh, but it, it's a show about Christian mysticism. It's a show about esotericism. It's a show about the Nag Hammadi Library and the groups that made it. It's a show about kind of whatever I find interesting this week that's related to those topics. But it's always related to those topics somehow. Joining me again is... Dr. M. David Litwa, uh, all-time champion of the show, one of our favorite scholars, one of our audience's favorite scholars, uh, Dr. Litwa. Uh, so uh, you have been uh, requested a, a number of times to come back on the show. So we're really happy to have you back on to talk about your book, The Evil Creator. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it, Jonathan. And it's great being back here as always. Great. And, you know, normally I open up uh, the show with uh, with a plug for our Patreon, which I'll do quick, which is patreon.com slash Gnostic. Can't do the uh, show about uh, your support. But, you know, a better Patreon <laughs> is patreon.com slash mdavidlitwa. So uh, head over there because you get exciting, exclusive content from Dr. Litwa uh, every week, uh, a couple times a week. The, what, how three times a week, update? yes. Yeah. I shoot for three times a week, um, yeah. and I answer everybody's question. If you join at, at a certain tier, um, yeah, I'm doing lots of stuff there. For, for those who want to learn a bit of Greek, I'm doing that. Um, those who join the Patreon can also get a book deal. I know that the book we're going to be discussing here is ridiculously priced. I've got um, three extra copies that... Uh, if you join the Patreon, I'll send it to you signed, uh, basically half what you'll pay on Amazon or wherever you're buying from. So uh, consider it. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Litwa has recently launched a YouTube channel. I put up the very long URL on, on the screen for those watching and not listening, but it will be linked in the notes. So definitely head over there. And, and actually, uh, yeah, sign up for, for Dr. Litwa's Patreon. Uh, get that signed copy of The Evil Creator. But if you miss out on that, it is an expensive book. But your local library, they have a web page. You can go there and you can request that they buy it and order it in. So that way you can read it. That way you can uh, get some royalties over to, to an awesome scholar and uh, continue all this work. Okay, we're not here to do hours and hours of commercials. Uh, we were talking about before the show, I sent uh, Dr. Lipwa about three hours of questions, which we're probably not going to have time to get to. I basically asked him to open up uh, The Evil Creator and read it from beginning to end. So we're going to do our best to, to cover uh, some of... Uh, uh, what this uh, very interesting, very awesome, uh, as I say in the questions without trying to, to be too flattering, is, is a paradigm shifting work. So it, it is uh, definitely a, a different paradigm than uh, uh, many of the mainstream uh, uh, narratives from the past. But first, Dr. Litwa, I think this is important. It's, it's something that I haven't really talked about on the show before. Can you quickly tell us what is reception history and what it has to do with your book? Yeah, so reception history, I mean, we all do reception history. It's that sense of texts are just like us, we're locked in time. And when you, in traditional historical critical scholarship, people tended to look for what they called the original, or what's better called the initial interpretation. So what, what did the initial hearers of Paul's letters understand by Paul's letters. But because Paul's letters have been stuck on the arrow of time now for about 2,000 years, you can sort of cut a segment into that arrow and, and you know, read Paul's letters not in the year 50, but in the year 100 or 150 or 250 or 350 or 1,000 or the year 1,500 or the year 2022. And you can read Paul in all of those years. And when you're looking at the that post initial interpretation of the letters, you're doing reception history. Mm -hmm. And in order to do reception history well, you need to know a lot about the historical context. So in the context of this book, we're talking about Marcion, who's early second century. And so if you want to talk about Marcion's reading of Paul. Mar Marcin is one of the earliest known readers of Paul, but he's not the earliest. Um, if you want to talk about the way he 
receives Paul or reads Paul, then you've got to know a lot about the early second century and his context in order to talk responsibly about that. So that's the goal. Yeah. Well, before launching into to Marcion, if we can go back a, a, a little bit further uh, in time before, before him, and can you tell us about the origin of this idea of, of an evil creator and what it's got to do with the Egyptian god Sesh and what it's got to do with donkeys? Sure. Well, the thesis of the book is that the concept of the evil creator is uh, almost entirely an early Christian concept. That is, early Christians invented the idea of the evil creator. But along with saying that, I also acknowledge that there were antecedents to the early idea of an of an evil creator and those antecedents have to do with the cultural interaction between jews in egypt and native egyptians in the hellenistic period that is um, you know ptolemaic egypt if you're familiar with that era um, alexander the great took over egypt founded the city of alexandria um, in the, around 330, and the Greeks or Macedonians ruled Egypt until the year uh, 30 BCE, approximately. And that's the Hellenistic period in Egypt. And during that period, there were many, many Jews emigrating, or sorry, immigrating to Egypt, and they interacted with native Egyptians and Jews were at the time in the process of inventing themselves and they brought over their traditions of the Exodus and as many of you know in the Exodus story the Egyptians are the villains or at least Pharaoh is, is a villain and the, the all of Egypt is punished with these horrible ten plagues and so Egyptians as you might imagine don't don't really like that um, and for good reason. I mean, it's it's really a horrible story um, if your ancestors are depicted as, you know, being eaten by flies and frogs and uh, having their precious river turned to blood and wandering around in the utter darkness of, and you know, a three day long night and having the Jewish deity kill all the firstborn children of Egypt, um, that must have been quite shocking for Egyptians to read. So what we see is Egyptians and people of Egyptian heritage, but also Hellenized Egyptians, counterpunching against Jewish mythology and saying that, okay, you think this Exodus story happened in the past. Well, if it did happen, then this God is a monster. And what you're really worshiping is not some benevolent deity, but it's the deity that we call Set. And Set is um, a the evil deity of the Egyptians in, in ancient Egyptian tradition and lore. He has an animal head, which the Greeks identified with the donkey head and he is associated with the color red. He is god of storms and of chaos, and he brings chaos. And so, you know, the Egyptians are being slightly male malevolent here, but in a sense, they are simply identifying the god of the Jews who manifests himself as a, as a desert deity and Set is also associated with the desert sands. Um, Yahweh is a desert deity. He leads his people to a desert mountain. There's a big storm. He turns rivers to blood. There's, you get the red character. Um, he kills people. Um, he's sort of like an anti-god from the Egyptian perspective. And so they identify him as Set. And they tell stories about you know, Jews worshiping this deity long before Christianity comes onto the scene. 
So in a sense, when you look at the evil creator idea, the way had been prepared for hundreds of years for Christians then who in the early second century were trying to divorce themselves from their Jewish and Judean kind of communities and carve out their own separate identities, there was this movement to say that actually the Judean deity is, is not the high God. He's not the God that Jews say he is. He is uh, something else, a lower deity, often posing as the high God and uh, manifesting himself in very ugly sort of ways, which is your best key for understanding that he's not the chief deity. Right. So we have this idea sort of floating around in the background before Christianity comes along. Um, and to, uh, to, to skip ahead um, to, uh, to, to Marcion, right? So uh, can you give us a, a little bit of an overview of who Marcion was? And, and I, I put this in as a bonus question. Uh, is it true he was almost Pope? Well, it's definitely not true that he was almost Pope. Um, I mean, more for the obvious reason that that institution really doesn't get started um, until probably early third century. Um, the Marcion does go to Rome. Um, he's originally from Asia Minor, um, uh, sort of right south of the Black Sea. Um, and he uh, he's quite successful as a recruiter in Asia Minor in those sort of uh, cities on the coast, Ephesus probably, and Smyrna and other places. And he then goes to the beating heart of empire, Rome, and what he finds there in the 140s is a series of fragmented house churches, basically. Um, some of them communicating, some of them not communicating with each other. And there's no central structure. And there's just different leaders, often called presbyters, who are teaching different versions of Christianity. You've got Valentinus there at the same time. Um, you've, you're gonna get Marcellinians there. Um, there, you're also later in the century gonna get Montanists um, and several other groups. Justin is there in the 150s, Justin Martyr. Tatian is there in the 160s. All of these, leaders, independent leaders, are leading independent groups. But occasionally, it seems like the presbyters meet on occasion for like an overall committee meeting. And they have, or they're beginning to centralize their economic structures. Um, so one of the first thing that Marcion does when he gets to Rome is he, he donates a massive amount of money to the fund uh, for, for essentially probably for church uh, charity fund. Um, we don't know exactly what he pinned it for, but it was a fantastic amount of money. Um, and we know from you know, vague, vague reports that uh, he spent year, many years in, in Rome in communion with the, the churches there. He had his own group there. And at some sort of meeting of the presbyters, when he presented his own theology and was very sharp in his criticism of the Hebrew deity and uh, emphasize the passages that you can't put new wine into old wine skins, that there was a break. And the powers that, that were at the time didn't have the power to excommunicate Marcin. Um, you'll often see this error in the literature that you know Marcin was excommunicated. But all of, all of that assumes a very anachronistic picture of what the Roman church looked like at the time. There was no Pope, there was no power of excommunication. Marcion left the, the circle of 
presbyters, the committee of presbyters, by his own decision. And he began emphasizing that his movement, his group of Christian recruits, were a, a separate entity from the other little Christian groups who were no longer in communion. That is, they didn't share you know, the elements of the Eucharist anymore. So that when you don't do that anymore, that's a sign that you are a separate organization. And Marcin continued to do what he did best, which was recruiting um, and publishing what some have called the first New Testament and leading a very successful, you know, still relatively small, but, but spread out in many, many cities of the ancient Mediterranean and leading a church until his death, which was probably around 160. So as I was saying at, at the top of the show, like I, I definitely see your book as, as a paradigm shift because the story that's usually told, the story that, that I've heard is goes something like this. Um, Marcion and the Marcionites preached to gods, a strict and law obsessed creator who's not evil, right? We're, we're, we in, intro the show talking about this, this evil deity, but in this previous narrative about Marcion, this creator god is not evil. He's very strict. He, he's uh, very harsh. He has a, a harsh law that if you, you break it, then punishment comes upon you, but it's, it's not malevolent. And this is contrasted, and, and this is, this is the, Ju the Judean god. Um, and this is contrasted with an alien god of love that has nothing to do with this world or perhaps even this universe, who is completely separate from this, this, this other uh, uh, deity, this creator god. And this god of love kind of uh, sees how people are suffering, so sends Jesus to, to save us and to save us from these, these harsh laws. What, what is wrong, in, in your opinion, with this, this narrative? Well, that is exactly the narrative of Adolf von Harnack, who wrote a very famous book on Marcion in the early 20th century called Marcion, the Gospel of an Alien God. And, you know, it sounds cool. And it certainly, you know, nowadays it kind of sounds like one of those weird conspiracy theories where, you know, typically Americans will might say that, oh, I don't know, maybe God is an alien, just a big, really smart alien. Um, but that's not what Harnack was saying. He he basically gave us a kind of a Lutheran picture of Marcion, hmm. in which Marcion recovered sort of the true gospel of Paul from Catholic distortions. Um, and, you know, Harnack himself was, was Lutheran, and the problem with Harnack's construction is he, he reads later Marcionite developments back into Marcion because it, it was true that in later Marcionite developments, like for instance, with Apelles, and I've got an episode on Apelles and on, on YouTube and on Patreon, Apelles was a follower of Marcion and he, among several other Marcionite theologians, approximated a more Valentinian position where he said that God was, the Judean God was just, and that there's a, there's a good God, and there's a just God, and then there's a devil. So that was a Marcionite position in the late second century, but from what we can tell, that wasn't Marcion's position. Marcin's position was there was a good deity, very much platonically conceived, absolutely immaterial and benevolent, without a single shade or shadow of darkness. Um, and then there was the Judean deity who was or who called himself just, but his justice was a manifestation of evil. After all, Marcion liked to quote Isaiah 45, 7, which in his Bible read, Ego imi 
Haktizon Kaka, which was the Judean God speaking, I am the one who creates evils. And, you know, Marcion and his heirs could point to other passages in the Septuagint of the Judean God doing some gosh darn evil looking things like firebombing the city of Sodom, preventing Adam and Eve from gaining knowledge from the tree of life, um, flooding the world, killing every man, woman, and child, plus all the animals, except for a few exceptions, and the dinosaurs, you know, not to the fundamentalists here. Uh, but after that, he, you know, sponsored she bears coming and um, he caused she bears to come and, and eat about 40 little children who were making fun of Elisha because Elisha was bald. And this seemed like a good opportunity for Elisha to send a curse to these little kids, all of whom were eaten and their bones broken at the command and impulse of the Judean local deity. Now I've been calling him a deity, but that's not actually the case for Marcion because Marcion was a Platonist. And that means that he didn't have this sort of Persian or Chinese kind of dualist or Manichaean kind of dualist system. You know, it, it isn't yin and yang here. God is good. And if you have a being who is not good, then he's not God. Now, the trouble is the Judean deity, as well as many other deities, you know, we're not just picking on the Judean deity here. There's also the Phrygian deity and the Egyptian deities. And, you know, today, I don't know, African deities and Chinese deities, okay, who are all claiming to be God or gods, but they're all involved in mischievous acts which shows that they actually belong to a different category, which the ancient Greeks called daimonis. Mm. And so they're not actually God. And it's much more like in the Platonic system where you have a ultimate good with a capital G. And then below that good, there is a demiurgos or demiurge and all the Demiurge's family, who are, are his minions, his, his bureaucracy, so to speak, and they are the lower middle management of the cosmos, and they do the dirty work of getting their hands dirty in the mud and uh, cre of, of creating this cosmos, basically, <laughs> <laughs> which is a dirty, dirty job. Um, and they are not good according to, to Marcion, that, that middle management level. Um, they are tyrannical, bloodthirsty, dangerous. And the point of Christianity, the point of Jesus coming to earth in, is revealing the truly good deity and helping you to then transcend your local enculturated manifestations of deity and embracing the true and universal deity who is the true father of Jesus Christ and omnibenevolent. Now it's often said that, you know, I mean, Marcin gets picked on usually by modern theologians who don't really know much about second century history. Um, and, you know, many an apologist and an author influenced by apologetics, you know, that Marcion was a black and white kind of a thinker who couldn't reconcile a just and a good God. You know? um, but yeah, I mean, the, I think the questions he was dealing with and to, and to be fair to Marcion, and the, the point of history is to be fair, obviously, I'm not here to promote Marcion's theology. I don't really care. I don't hold it myself, but I do think that we should be fair. And it's not fair to write him off as a simple-minded dualist who believes in two gods. Marcion 
that's a form of polytheism. Marcion would never accept the idea that he was a polytheist. He, he would laugh at that. Now, for Marcion, there is, like for all Christians of his time, one single God who is good. And you have to ask yourself, in fairness to Marcion, you know, I mean, is it so easy for Christians today or in later tradition to reconcile in their heads a just and a good deity? And do you call the God that commands genocide just in any sense of the word? Do you call the God who kills all living things on earth just in any sense of the word? You know, who is involved in terrible, terrible things and commands the killing of millions of animals so that he can breathe in the fumes from the sacrifices. Is there anything just in that system? Well, these were the questions that Marcin was asking. And I think in some ways he was well ahead of his time. Right, right. So it's th this cartoon. It, he's he's actually a, a, of him as a as a kind of a, I would say the cartoons almost that yeah that he's simple minded right that he uh, uh, that, that we get from the heresiologists and maybe even from some modern thinkers right that he he's he's not smart enough uh, and he just uh, to to comprehend a. Uh, 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 sophisticated enough to 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 understand uh, anything, but there must just be a good god and an evil god. Uh, but but in fact, uh, if I'm understanding you correctly, he's he's sort of in that that middle Platonic, uh, early Christian, Roman, rather sophisticated philosophical uh, uh, approach. Is that is that right? Yeah, I mean, he's not himself a philosopher, but his whole thinking is permeated by middle platonic categories, yeah. where, again, you have a high, supreme, benevolent deity, and then everyone on the middle management is a, is a daimon, and those are the gods of the nations. And he gets this, you know, exactly from the Psalms, right? Because Psalm 95 is, all the gods of the nations are daimonized. Mm -hmm. Um, so this isn't an invention of, of Marcion. This is something he can read right out of his Septuagint. It's something that Paul quoted. And so all the other deities are middle management deities, you know, deities like Zeus and Attis and Phrygia and Osiris and Egypt. But what makes Marcion different than your early or incipient Catholic Christian is whereas the incipient Catholics want to say, the local Jewish, the local Judean, I should say, the local Judean sprite, the local Judean daimon, uh, that God who is always sticking out, sticking his neck out for the Jews, and the God who is speaking in, in the Septuagint, um, cursing people and throwing them into exile, and, and then, you know, doing other fun sorts of things, you know, and if you obey him, he's quite nice to you, uh, but don't cross him. Um, that deity, they wanted to, to say, is actually identified with the universal good. So that's their intellectual move. And Marcin's intellectual move is to say, frankly, I don't see the Judean deity acting any differently from the bloodthirsty Zeus. Mm. Um, I don't see that deity acting any differently from Osiris or even Seth, you know. I mean, he's unpredictable, dangerous, chaotic, jealous for his own glory. He acts exactly like any other middle management Mediterranean so-called deity. I mean, if you cross him, he'll throw a nuclear bomb in your face, okay? Okay. Um, you know, David has one sin with Bathsheba, and then he's given a choice. Um, you know, it, it's it's sort of like like a mafia. You know, God gives him a choice, and okay, what do you want to happen to you? You know, uh, I can break your legs, uh, I can shoot your family, or I can 
um, you know, I don't know, take your money or something like that. That's the sort of decision that David is given, you know, we can send a plague or I can kill your kid or something else, which I'm forgetting. You know, this is the kind of deity that Marcion, who knew the Septuagint very well, this is another misconception about Marcion that he rejected the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously not. I mean, he reads it, you know, in his own way and he knows it better than most. What he rejects is using it as a scriptural authority, but he doesn't reject it. Because for Marcion, the, the Septuagint is a good window, is the best window into understanding the local character of the Judean sprite. And it's a big mistake for Christians to identify that local sprite or daimon or godling as the universal good. That's the intellectual move. Right. So you, you mentioned he rejected the Septuagint as, as scripture, and you previously, uh, in passing, mentioned that, that some consider him to have created the first, quote-unquote, New Testament. Can you tell us about the uh, Apostolon and the Evangelion? Did I say those right? Yeah. Um, so we know that a letter collection of Paul's letters existed probably by the late first century. And we know that there were various gospels floating around, certainly by the early second century. And Marcion's great achievement is to say, let's combine them. In other words, let's have a book of Paul's writings, which he called the Apostolicon, connected to what for Marcion was the single and only valid gospel, which he called the Evangelion, which is just means gospel. And let's combine them and make them into one book. Because in the ancient world, you could do that. You know, you didn't have to put everything on a scroll. You could make a sort of a modern book, which we call a, a codex. And uh, the codex technology Christians began adopting that technology right around Marcion's time because it fit more information and was easier to use. You know, you didn't have to roll up your scroll and roll it back and 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 to find your place, you, you could flip the pages like we do in a modern book. So Marcion realized that he could put both his gospel and a collection of Paul's letters in a single book under a single bound volume. And that's essentially the New Testament, right? Because all other later manifestations of the New Testament follow that same structural map. You have gospels first, mm -hmm. then Pauline letters, and then you know they get they get to adding um, like the miscellaneous category, which is uh, Catholic epistles, and then finally they tack on that most disputed of all books, the apocalypse. Marcion is too early for any of those later debates. You know, he doesn't, he's before the Catholic epistles, he's before the pastorals. So all that he has and all that he thinks is authentic is one single gospel and followed by 10 Pauline letters. And we know the structure of the book, and we know what were distinctive Marcionai readings of his New Testament, because later heresiologists, mostly Tertullian, but also Epiphanius and others, go through Marcion's New Testament, and they tell you point by point where it differed from theirs. And that's how we can reconstruct a bit about a bit from what Marcion's New Testament looked like. So it's not like a Q situation where we've we've never found a manuscript of Q, and it's a pure scholarly hypothesis generated in the 19th century. We know that Marcion's New Testament existed. 
and we can reconstruct it based on the earliest readers. But of course, it's a book that wouldn't have survived antiquity yeah. because, you know, the later um, dominant faction of Christianity, the imperial Christianity in the fourth century uh, would never have tolerated that book surviving. Do you think that he inspired the, the creation of, uh, of of the New Testament, of New Testaments, that other Christians see what he was doing and being like, hey, that that's, I don't like this guy, but this is a cool idea. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think that's indisputable. Um, I can't say that he created the New Testament because we don't know what he called his bound book. We don't know if he called it Hekaini Diathiki in Greek. Um, but the idea, the structural idea of what a New Testament is, that is gospels plus letters that are considered to be inspired, that's Marcion's idea. He's the first publisher to copyright that structure. This isn't in your book, but but I've got to ask. I have this marked in the, and it follows up quite quite well to what you were just saying, and with the mention of Q, uh, I have it marked in our show notes as digression exclamation mark. So I, I can't talk about Marcion without asking your opinion or your gut feeling or your wild speculation, what have you, on the, his possible relationship to the composition of the Gospel of Luke. So do you think he edited Luke like the church fathers said that he did? Or do you think that he wrote a proto-Luke? Like that he was the creator of, of of some form of early version of what we now know as the Gospel of Luke, and that that was later edited by some other Christians to become, you know, the Gospel of Luke that we've received? Or do you think that he received a proto-Luke already in use in some Christian communities that more easily worked with his reading? And that this text was later edited with some anti-Marcian messaging to become our Gospel of Luke? Or dot, dot, dot. <laughs> well, this is the question that is um, is, is a separate episode. Um, and actually, I've already got um, on my Patreon a, a full episode on Marcion and Luke Acts. So for those who join the Patreon, look that up. Okay. Um, I'm eventually, if I don't die... Um, going to write a book on Marcion, and I'm I'm finishing up a book right now on the Nascenes. Um, I'm going to turn to Clement of Alexandria next, but after that, I have promised to myself uh, before I die, I'm going to write a book on on, on Marcion, and I'm going to tell you what I think in detail. Um, but the very short answer is that no, Marcion is not a writer of a gospel. He would have been horrified by that idea. Mm. Um, <laughs> I mean, Marcin is like the most traditional Christian that you can imagine trying to get us back to the true and authentic gospel. He would not have wrote one and invented that. Okay. He viewed himself as a preserver of a heritage, an apostolic heritage, exactly like other Christians of his time. So yes, he had a gospel, which we might call Proto-Luke. It didn't include a birth story and it was different than our version of Luke, but it was probably the version current in Pontus in the late first century, the version that Marcion grew up with. And this version, after Marcion's break with the Roman ecclesial structure, Marcion said was plagiarized by other people. And so the theory is that Marcion's version of Luke was expanded into canonical Luke and whoever expanded it was the same editor who put in the prefaces to Luke and Acts. And he's probably the author of Acts. So the revised version 
is not just Luke, but it's Luke acts now as a kind of diptych, a double volume work published around 150 and in many ways anti-Marcionite. It writes Marcion out of history. It undercuts Marcion by presenting a Paul who is incompatible with Marcionite thought. Yeah, 100%. There's, I, there's no other way to, to read Acts uh, in, in my mind. Also, the theory that, that you just mentioned is my preferred theory as well. So for the relationship of Luke, the composition of Luke and, uh, and Marcion. So, uh, okay, we got to get back to your book. Um, I, I know that, again, uh, we could really dive into the proof text and, you know, talk for a really long time, but we keep, you know, we, we are talking about Paul and the letters of Paul. Can you tell us a little bit about how Marcion and the Marcionites use some ideas of Paul to back their theology? And actually, I want to start with one about Jesus being cursed on the cross. Because you mentioned that the, the the Judean God being a one who curses, can, can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Well, the Judean deity has a job description, which you can read when you pick up the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, or if you can read Greek, um, the Septuagint. You should always be working with the Septuagint because that was Marcion's Bible, uh, what he was familiar with. And according to that book, the Judean deity curses people who are hung from a cross. All people who are hung from the cross. And that's in Deuteronomy. And it's very clearly stated and it's very clearly quoted by Paul in Galatians. Cursed is everyone who hangs from a tree. But interestingly, Paul here was being very sneaky because if you look back to the Septuagint, it, he omitted something because it actually says the one hanging is cursed by God. And Paul omitted by God. But Marcion would not have missed that point. Okay, so because that's exactly the point that he wanted to emphasize that whoever is crucified is cursed by the Judean deity. Or, I should say, the Judean daimon claiming to be a deity. <laughs> it's always a mouthful to say that, but that's what I mean by that. Yeah. Um, so that was revolutionary for Marcion. And it was his best proof, probably, for saying that a Christian thinking correctly, that is theologically correctly, could not say that the Judean deity was the father of Jesus Christ. Because the Judean deity cursed Jesus and was the enemy of Jesus. And the Judean deity has a long history, has a criminal record of cursing people he doesn't like, right? So he curses Cain. He curses Noah's son, Ham. He curses the little boys who make fun of a balding Elisha. And he curses the land of Israel when he gets upset. He is a God who curses. And understand what a curse is. A curse is something that will lead to death. So it's, a, it's murder. It's, a, it's divine murder. And it's designed for the Judean daimon to eliminate his enemies. Why would Jesus be an enemy of the Judean deity? Well, you see him all throughout, even New Testaments that survive today. You see him constantly getting into controversy with Judean leaders who think that they're doing God's will by obeying the Judean God's law, and Jesus will have none of it. 
he's constantly egging them on, peeling on the Sabbath, not following the rituals of the Sabbath, saying that the Sabbath doesn't apply to him because he's the son of man and he's Lord of the Sabbath, going into synagogues on the Sabbath and making a show of healing people with back ailments and hand ailments. I mean, he's egging them on. And Marcion was no fool. He knew that Jesus would finally make enemies of the Judean daimon because he's not following that daimon's law. It's a superstition, you know, like don't eat pork. There's nothing good or bad about eating pork. Well, maybe there is nutritionally, but they weren't thinking in, the, in those terms. Um, that's just the superstitious law of a local daimon who happens to rule in one corner of Palestine. And Jesus comes under the scene as a drunkard and a wine bibber. You know? <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't seem to care about the food laws. And he says, you know, it doesn't matter what enters into your body. It matters what comes out of it, it comes out of your mouth. So these kinds of passages were taken as, you know, a direct attack on the authority of the Judean daimon who gave that superstitious law, said that you couldn't eat shellfish. You know, goodbye to all those lovely lobsters and crabs you could be enjoying. That was a deity who eventually got so frustrated with Jesus, he cursed him and he killed him. And if you believe that it, it's not just the Jewish leaders, the Judean leaders who are against Jesus, the Judean leaders aren't against Jesus in, in a sort of final sense. They are merely following the regulations of their of the one they think is God. And it's really God, this Judean daimon, who is behind the scenes orchestrating the final termination of this annoying little bug called Jesus, who comes into his domain and says that there is a God above God. Yeah. Um, well, we are uh, running low on time. I did want to go for some more Paul with you. But hey, folks at home, I bet you you could read the Pauline letters and figure out some proof texts of your own that Marcy would probably use. Sash, you're going to read uh, Dr. Litwa's book. So um, what does the evil creator have to do with modern thinkers? I, I really wanted to get get this, make sure that, that, that we talked on, on this question, talked about how you, how you end the book, because I always want to connect these ancient ideas, these ancient thinkers to the modern day and, and why they might matter for people who don't have the kind of brain worms that I have that uh, that finds this stuff uh, fascinating. So so what does evil creator have to do with modern thinkers, maybe especially those connected with, with so-called new atheism and so-called uh, Jesus mythicism? Well, the new atheists have essentially been involved in reinventing a wheel that Marcion invented thousands of years before him. And Marcion's wheel actually turns better in many ways. Um, which is to say that, you know, new atheism, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, it's, it's tough to exaggerate or it's tough to say exactly what motivates everyone. And it's just too complex a phenomenon to say, but there is a lot of angry, burned out Christians among that crowd who got a Sunday school version of Christianity. And then they read the Bible and discovered that the Judean deity was a monster. I mean, he's about as far away from Western values and human rights as you can imagine. And it takes pastors years of training to either ignore those very questionable passages or to massage away the fact that they worship a God who commands genocide and firebombs a city and 
kills the global population. Even exiles his own people. I mean, he's an unpredictable sort of a tyrannical personality. And so it takes a lot of intellectual work to say, well, actually, this this God, he has some rough edges, but it's really because he's just. And in the end, he loves you, you know. You can square that circle. All right. And trust me, I mean, <laughs> there's not a church in America who doesn't try to square that circle or in Canada, I imagine, who doesn't try to square that circle every Sunday. Okay. But for so many, a generation who has lost their faith, there's a generation who's lost their faith because they've been hurt by something in the, in the church. And I, either before they're falling out or after they're falling out, they go back and they read what the Bible says, because most of the most Christians, you know, they don't read the Bible cover to cover. And it's only when you get sort of really interested in it kind of historically or, you know, what does this book actually say that you start reading. And if you can get through the genealogies, you're well on your way toward the global flood already in Genesis 6. And if you finish all that and you get through the 10 plagues and the firebombing of Sodom and all the vicissitudes of the kings and the railings of the prophets and you close the book, a lot of people are just frankly horrified. Yeah. And, and it, it they can't... The New Testament too, you know, Revelation, a lot of people die. <laughs> a lot of, you know, Absolutely. the ending is pretty, the pretty, pretty dynamic. Lots of, lots of uh, uh, people uh, being cooked in that. So sorry. So you're saying so when people read the whole Bible. <laughs> Absolutely. No, what I mean cover by cover is, yeah, you yeah. you you start in Genesis and you end in Revelation. And this is Marcion's great insight, right? Because yeah. he's not just saying that, you know, it's some kind of Old Testament deity that's the problem. No, the deity that puts Jesus on the cross, or the pseudo-deity that puts Jesus on the cross, is very much a New Testament character. Yeah. But the one who arranges that is the true tyrant, hmm. the true, truly evil being masquerading as someone who is just, but is really just bloodthirsty and likes to see the blood oozing down and enjoys murdering people secretly as an ex exercise of his local power which was never universal but tyrants you know they can only be local and then pretend that they're universal so that's that's what we're dealing with so i can see why a lot of the new atheists would be attracted to marcion um, and i think everyone should historically know marcion i mean so you don't simply have to reinvent the the wheel but I think it's I think it's important also to understand that Marcion's contribution to history is that he was trying to be a Christian, and he never ever ever gave up his Christian identity, even though he believed that the creator of this world was evil, and that's why I say you know you have to get your head wrapped around this, that this is primarily an early Christian idea. It's people who are trying to be Christians, trying to be faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ, who are also saying, yeah, the creator is evil. And the point of religion is to get beyond him, right? And when we get beyond him, we don't need to worry about, you know, the God of the nations. Because we don't care about nations anymore and nations claiming, you know, God bless America or God bless Canada or, wh or whoever. I mean, it, every nation is going to claim that its local daimyo is, you know, <laughs> the one favoring them. <laughs> All that is hogwash. The point of Christianity and what is really helpful in deflating the kind of national versions of Christianity that 
we are sometimes plagued with is that Marcin says the gospel, if you realize the gospel, it is to go beyond those national sprites and daimones and to rise above to the true omnibenevolent deity who is unknown, right? Unknown. So you can't put him in a box and say that, you know, uh, that he's in he's in your pocket or that he's favoring your nation. It's a God without borders. It's a God beyond the cosmos. And in that sense, you could still call him an alien deity, although I, I think that Marcin wouldn't call him that because Marcin did think that the God of Jesus Christ was alien from this world, but so did every Platonist. I mean, that's like the most basic teaching of Platonism, right? Is that God is not material and he can't be identified and pegged with a series or a list of attributes that you then, you know, I don't know, bank on, you know, as like a, a stable kind of character that's already an anthropomorphizing which is highly dangerous in, in theology. So what Marcion, I think, encourages people today is to, yes, go to the God beyond God. That's not a comfortable thing. He's not necessarily a personal deity. He's not friendly. He's not going to give you a hug. Um, but he, is, he isn't foreign to this world. I think Marcion, you know, like all Christians of his time, believed in spirit and that God's spirit which was an immaterial spirit for a Platonist, could inhabit the human heart. So in that sense, even the God beyond God pervaded and belonged to this world. He was an alien. It's not like the creator, you know, found some way to lock out, you know, the good God. No, you can't do that. Um, it's simply that you know, God is, uh, to quote something in the Muslim tradition, you know, he's closer to us than our jugular vein, but you don't notice him and you don't comprehend him and it's impossible to. And if you see a theology out there or people holding a theology of God killing people, or ordering people to kill other people, or being nationalistic, or being local, or being cultural in that sense, um, ethnic, then the best thing that you can do, but that's the God of terrorism. Let me, let me just say that plainly. That's the God that terrorists um, make up. That's the, that's the God motivating global ter terrorism. It's the God that is identified with a particular culture that goes and kills people and orders other people to kill people, right? Yeah. Um, in order to sort of get beyond that, you've got to imagine the, the God beyond God. And that's not very comfortable because you don't know him. And you'd rather just keep it more simple, liberal Christianity saying that, you know, God is love, let's sing Kumbaya, but maybe he's not. I mean, it's, he's not, he's not uh, against love, but he's above our concept of love. Um, he is unknown in that sense, or she is unknown, or it is unknown. I mean, <laughs> we, we, can't see, we can't use gender anymore either. So I, I think, you know, Marcin is, is really gesturing at something which is still useful today, that, you know, if you want to call yourself a theist, but you still believe that God killed people in the past, or, you know, that, that God favors your particular nation, or is somehow still ethnic, then that's very problematic theologically. And, you know, you don't have to take Marcion's route, although you could. You know, there are certainly uh, evil forces in this world that are claiming to be something good. So in that respect, you know, you could translate Marcion into modern terms. Um, but you, 
I think he's he's still useful for questioning and for helping people to question who God really is and for removing the arrogance of saying that, you know, one community or one nation ha and one particular group has a kind of um, capital, theological capital that they can then use to exercise power in the world. Well, we're, we're at uh, the, an hour mark now, so we should wrap up. But I was wondering, Dr. Litt, while you, you end the, the book of a very powerful paragraph, I was wondering if we could end the show with that paragraph. Is there any way you, you could read it to us? Uh, sure, yeah. I'll um, turn to the page here. Um, I'm not sure if it's powerful, but I, I did spend some time crafting it. Um, uh, on 169, I said, if this book does anything in the lives of modern readers, I hope that it will further enhance our collective ability to read the Bible through the eyes of the other, and that it will inspire new thoughts and categories, allowing us to read this monument of literature in more nuanced, honest, and ethical ways. We must never allow negativity about the character of the biblical creator to translate into hostility toward those who worship the creator by their own lights and according to their own traditions. At the same time, we should continue to think seriously about developing positive images of God, for we are what we imagine. If deity is tyrannical, bloodthirsty, egoistic, jealous, and evil, then there is and always will be an excuse for us to be so. Thankfully, the sword cuts both ways in portraying deity as good, loving, kind, and merciful. We uphold a flourishing exemplar for the divine image, which is, or at least, or is at least imagined to be ourselves. Wonderful. Well, uh, the, the book is The Evil Creator. Uh, head to patreon.com slash Litwa and Dr. Litwa. Thanks again so much for joining us. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Take care.